Uh, my name is Leo, and I will talk about uh, reference-based MRI, among uh, other activities we have uh, in this field in the lab. So what is MRI? MRI is basically a one giant magnet, um, which allows us to um, have multiple, multiple imaging um, applications, such as brain imaging, body imaging, and functional MRI to uh, analyze uh, dynamic processes in the brain. And two major problems in MRI today is that first, it, is, it has a very slow scanning time, about 15 minutes per scan, and it is quite noisy. Uh, meaning if you take a look at this image right here, you can see that it is, it is a conventional brain MRI, it's quite noisy, and the way to deal with that today is to simply repeat the scan over and over again, uh, and average uh, uh, over multiple repetitions until we get a sufficient, sufficient signal to noise ratio right here. Um, and the question is whether we can have fast, high SNR MRI without compromising on image quality. And the, and the answer is yes, if we take into account uh, some assumptions on the data. So what I'm going to show you here is our approach it's called reference-based MRI. And it is composed of three different components. The first one is that we ex exploit the structure of the MRI signal, which is sparse in some transport domain. Uh, the second one is that we use uh, reference images known in advance, application dependent, um, to improve the reconstruction and save time. And the third component is that we use iterative algorithm in the reconstruction side uh, that adapts itself to the actual similarity between the image we want to acquire and the reference image known in advance. And the benefits of our approach is that it, it allows us to, uh, to have faster acquisition with less than 10% of the sampling uh, data and uh, it allows us to have improved SNR with, uh, with no need for multiple repetitions. So the outline of my talk is the following. I will talk about a little bit about the background of MRI, compressed sensing MRI, and now, then I present our approach followed, followed by its theoretical aspects. I will so show some experimental results, then I will briefly discuss about the issue of undersampling in MRI, and I will summarize and draw some conclusions. So maybe the first one thing we have to understand when we, when we deal with MRI is, MRI is that MRI is not uh, acquired in, um, in the image domain like conventional steel imaging, but rather in the Fourier domain known as the case space. So here we have examples of various case spaces and their corresponding images. And in MRI, we simply uh, acquire this, uh, the data in the case space domain, perform an, an um, inverse Fourier transform, and get the data in, in the image domain, so the sampling um, the measurement model in MRI is quite simple. We actually acquire uh, Y, which is a Fourier transform of X, which is the image you would like to reconstruct. And how to sample the case space is, is a very uh, major issue because obviously we cannot sample the entire case space. This is a very time consuming process. Uh, so what we do, we basically undersample the case space and reconstruct the image using some assumptions of the data, uh, for instance, uh, wavelet sparsity in the wavelet domain, which is a very common sparsifying transform in MRI. Okay, so we know that we have to undersample the case, the case space, and the, quiz, and the question is how to do it. Obviously, if we, under, if we use a uniform undersampling of the case space, we get anything which we cannot resolve. Uh, we can use uniform undersampling, then we get um, incoherent artifacts which, which are quite difficult to resolve. And apparently the best way to sample the, the case space in MRI is to use variable density random sampling. And then we get low resolution images with incoherent artifacts that can be uh, resolved in the reconstruction process. And this brings us to the well-known compressed sensing MRI which is based on uh, recovering the image from, from fewer samples pr by promoting sparsity and consistency with measurements. So um, the most basic compressed sensing min MRI minimization equation is the following one, and where we have two terms. The first one enforces, enforces data consistency, and the second one pr promotes sparsity in some transfer domain, um, uh, for instance, the wave domain. But the major problem in, com in conventional compressed sensing is that it actually ignores um, application-specific redundancy. In many MRI applications, we have some reference image known in advance that can be used in order to uh, improve the reconstruction process or uh, to speed up the acquisition. And I'll, give you and I'll give you a few examples. The first one is when we have three-dimensional MRI. Three-dimensional MRI is mainly consists of two-dimensional slices stuck 
stacked one, of, one on, top of the, on top of the other. And when we take a deep, a deep look uh, in these uh, two-dimensional slices, we see that they are indeed noisy, but they are very similar. So we can exploit similarity ac across uh, different imaging slices to um, reduce time and to improve SNR. Another example would be multiple contrast MRI. MRI is composed of uh, various diff imaging contrasts, for instance, T1, T2, flare, and many other imaging contrasts. And we see a uh, similarity across different imaging contrasts that can be exploited in order, again, to reduce time and to improve the reconstruction process. The third application would be when we have repeated scan, when a patient is undergoing some kind of treatment or um, when we want to follow up a tumor, for instance, we have a tumor over here that we, uh, we want to track. So the patient uh, is being scanned every few months uh, to track the progression of the tumor. And we see that um, we can also exploit similarity across t uh, different time points of the same patient. So our main idea in, re in reference-based MRI is to exploit a reference scan to reduce time and to improve SNR. And the question is, Okay, how do we do it? We have some known reference image. How do we use that in this uh, uh, compressed sensing mechanism? So the naive approach would be, and in a moment you'll say why I'm saying, why I'm saying naive, is to, you, is to add an additional term to the minimization problem. So we have the data, the data consistency term, we have a, a term that promotes sparsity in the wavelength domain, and we add an additional term that promotes actually, actually similarity between the image we would like to acquire to reconstruct X and the reference image known in advance, X0. But the problem is that this uh, approach neglects the fact that in many MRI application, uh, similarity to a, refer a reference scan is not guaranteed. And I will give you a few examples for that. The first one would be when we're tracking a tumor. So we, m we might have cases of very aggressive tumors in which we see um, major changes between the baseline scan and the follow-up scan and we cannot assume that images are similar. Another example would be when we have two different imaging contrasts. So these imaging contrasts are quite similar in some regions, but in other regions they're completely different. So we cannot just assume that images are similar. We have to, to use some more sophisticated uh, um, approach to utilize the similarity. And uh, so our solution would be simply to add weights to the reconstruction problem. So our, our reference-based MRI reconstruction problem would look something like that. We add W1, W2, which are weighting matrices, and their goal is to relax or enforce uh, sparsity uh, on the sparse vector, this one, or the sparsity in the wave of domain. And the rationale behind W1 and W2 can be explained if we take a look at the desired, let's say, W2 in, 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 in two cases. Let's say, for instance, that X and the reference image are very similar. So in that case, you would like W2 to be the identity matrix because we would like to highly enforce similarity. Mm -hmm. And if, let's say, they're completely different, you would like to omit this term, and you would like W2 to be zero. So we can develop expressions for W1 and W2 accordingly, but the problem is that we don't know whether the images are similar or not. X is the image you would like to reconstruct. We don't know whether it is similar to the Im image we have at hand x0 or not. We, all, we, will only know that, we will only know that after we have acquired the data. Um, so the solution, our solution to that problem would be to use an iterative mechanism. So what we do is first we assume that, that the, there is no similarity between, between the reference scan and the image we would like to acquire, and we sample the data. Then we, we take only some, a part of the samples and uh, reconstruct the image, and based on this reconstruction, we um, estimate the matrices W1 and W2 according to the equations that are presented here, which align with the rationale I presented in the previous slide. Then we add more samples, repeat the reconstruction again, um, estimate the matrices again, and this process repeats itself until we have used uh, all of the samples, and W1 and W2 actually converge to match the actual, actual similarity between the reference scan and the, and the scan we would like to reconstruct. And to uh, give you some theoretical background and to show you that this, uh, there is also some theory behind this work, uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about the bounds uh, in the conventional compressed sensing problem and also with this way, uh, in this uh, weighted mechanism. So when we take a look at the conventional uh, 
a compressed sensing problem where we, where we have no prior, then the bound on the number of measurements required for uh, reconstruction of X with high probability, if we have um, a Gaussian sensing, sensing matrix, would be this expression where X is S sparse and X is the, with the, is the, has the length n and is S sparse. When we add uh, a prior X zero, and we have the naive, what I call the naive approach, so a recent development by some, uh, by Joao from UCL suggests that um, the bound is a bit more complicated, but and, and, and it actually depends also with some parameters derived from X zero and the relationship between X and X zero. We developed a bound for our reference based MRI for the, for the weighted scenario, where we also take a look also the weights uh, in the reconstruction problem, and we obtained a bit more complicated bound that looks like this and also depends not only with x and x0, but also with, the, with some parameters depending on w1 and w2. And to give you the sense of how this bound looks like, uh, we, we would take a look at two, dif two different scenarios. In the first one, we have what we call a good prior, where, where x is similar to x0. And, with, and, and now we're looking at the number of measurements, uh, at the success rate as, as a function of number of measurements. And we, you can see that the naive approach bound right here is very similar to the weighted bound. Um, but experimentally, the weighted bound, the weighted, uh, the performance of the weighted algorithms gives better results. But the more interesting scenario is where we have a bad prior. Okay, when x is is, is not similar to x zero, we see that the compressing bound is actually the same because it does not depend with the prior. Uh, but the L1, the naive approach bound, the L1 L1 bound right here, is getting quite worse while the weighted bound. Um, still exhibits reliable performance, and we can also see that in the experimental results, um, in both cases, the weighted, sen the weighted compressed sensing um, gives better results than the L1 and 1, and, and, and of course, the conventional compressed sensing uh, algorithm. So what I'm going to show you here is some experiments on, um, con in, in real MRI data. Experiments were carried out in two, in, in two institutions, um, Tel Aviv Sarasky Medical Center and the Weissman Institute have uh, well-established MRI facilities, and we used both Siemens and GE scanners. Uh, okay, so I'm going to show you a movie describing all the uh, our experiments. So first, we're going to see uh, the facility in the Tel Aviv Medical Center. This is uh, the brain res MRI research facility. We see our lab members here in front of the MRI scanner examining. Uh, some reconstruction results. Um, next, we're going to see the results of the follow-up MRI. So we undersampled the data, we used only 6% of the data, and if we don't use a reference image, then we don't see some features, but when we used our reference-based approach, we reveal features that cannot be seen uh, without the reference, and this is only using 6% of the data, and we know that these features are real because we also examined the uh, full data. Uh, now we see the scanner that was used for our experiments in uh, Tel Aviv Medical Center. Uh, the next application would be the SNR improvement. So we have uh, a noisy MRI obtained with one repetition. And with our approach, um, the SNR is, high is highly improved and comparable to the one obtained with four repetitions. So basically, we obtained the same SNR using only 25% of scanning time. Uh, okay, this is me examining some uh, reconstruction results at the hospital. And this application is the contrast similarity application in which we have two imaging contrasts, one on the sample, and we use the other one as a reference, and we actually sample only 15% of the data. And using our reference-based approach, we get a result similar to the one obtained with 100% of the data, so we actually used only 15% uh, of scanning time. The last application would be silent MRI. Okay, so I didn't mention that so far, but MRI is very noisy. I hope you didn't have the experience uh, to have MRI, but it's a very, very noisy experience. Experience, experience. And, uh, and you're about to hear um, the noise uh, patient here during an MRI exam. And thanks to the fact that we acquire much less data, we're able to redesign the sequence, the MRI sequence, to be much more quiet. So now you're going to hear, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. 
So now you're going to hear the um, noise you hear when you have when you have a real MRI. Okay, this is what you hear in a real MRI exam. Very noisy, very unpleasant experience. And with our reference-based approach, with our approach, uh, sub MRI, we it sounds something like that. Much more convenient, much less noisy, a better experience for the patient. And these are the guys who did the work in the with me in in the uh, Weizmann Institute. Uh, okay, so this is our experimental results. Uh, I would like to talk a bit about uh, undersampling in the case space. So we said, okay, we undersample the data in the case space and everything is great, but in fact, undersampling the case space is not so simple. Because when we undersample the case space, we get, we get data on a non-uniform grid, and we have to resample the data to a uniform grid to, to, to perform the reconstruction. And this problem is a very difficult and involves in inversion of huge matrices, and one of our works deal exactly with this, exactly with this problem, so we break the problem into di two different problems, and we actually uh, if, uh, uh, perform effic efficient implementation of projection using sparse system solvent and inside filtering, so we get uh, more or less the same result with much, much more efficient approach, and you can, uh, the, and you can read the paper to delve into the details, but I'd like to show you the results. So this is our approach right here, compared to some state-of-the-art results in the, in the literature. So we can see that our approach is much less noisy, and also if we take a look at the performance of our, uh, of our approach as a function of number of samples and the SNR, our approach is the dark one right here, we can see that it uh, outperforms all the state-of-the-art results, so we actually uh, get superior results compared to a popular algorithm with the same computational burden. Uh, so to summarize, I have shown you a reference-based MRI approach, which is based on iterative weighted reconstruction for fast high SNR MRI. I've also shown you that the theoretical aspects of our work, which also prove that um, our work theoretically performs better than conventional state-of-the-art approaches. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, approaches for case based sampling, and the nice thing is that uh, our method is applicable for a variety of MRI scanning protocol. Um, if you'd like to hear a, a bit more about our project, you're more than welcome to, to come to our poster uh, in, in the poster ex ex exhibition area outside. We have three posters there. there. The first one deals with, with the SNI improvement, the second one deals with silent MRI, and the third one is actually an extension of the ideas presented here to the world of uh, CT imaging. Uh, do you have a minute, Owen? Okay. So, okay, what I'm going to show you here is maybe the last slide, is, is, it may be the most interesting slide of this talk. Um, in many cases, we don't actually acquire uh, people in MRI, we acquire fruits and, fruits and vegetables because we want to see um, the results before, um, we, we want to see the consequences of our work on, on, fruit and on fruit and vegetables before we examine them on humans. And it's very nice to see how fruit and vegetables look in MRI, both undersampled and non-undersampled. So what, we, what you see here, are eight fruit and vegetables, un eight undersampled fruit, fruit and vegetables in MRI. They're very difficult uh, to be recognized. And the nice thing about fruit and vegetables in MRI that even if I give you the full data, they're quite difficult to be recognized. So this is obviously an apple, and this is obviously an onion in MRI, and this is obviously an orange. But who knows what's this one here? Do you have any idea? Tomato, great, very nice. Uh, okay, so this is a peach. You can see it by the pip inside. And what's that? Very tasty when hot. <laughs> it's corn. Great. And this one in here is very Israeli. That's a cactus. Great. And this one here is very interesting because in MRI, dry objects do not contribute to the signal. And this fruit has a very dry peel in this case. So we don't see the peel. We only see what's inside. So who can say what's inside? Pomegranate, okay? Uh, and, and, and we thank the Weizmann Institute for providing us, for providing us uh, with the uh, data and experiments. And these images summarize my talk. So uh, I hope it was interesting for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>